going to show you the Jessa method for changing out these Nintendo Switch charge ports. Now, there's lots of different ways to do this and everybody's kind of got their own way. I'm going to show you how I change these charge ports. Now, the first thing that I'm going to do is I'm going to see whether or not this device can charge with my little buddy, the USB-C ammeter. Here he is. This is this is the one that we have for sale at iPad Rehab Supply. You need to have one or something similar to this. We're going to connect this in line with the uh, charger that came with the switch. So I've got a actual bona fide switch charger because if you use a different charger you might have a different charging current result based on the wattage of the charger so just to keep everything always the same i like to stick with this charger all the time all right i'm going to plug it into the switch and let's see so we can read on here what these numbers are and we see that this switch is indeed able to negotiate for about 15 volts that's good but the charging current 0 0.13 130 milliamps that's way too low one thing i also like to do is just see if it's the same on both sides so i'll plug it in the other way Yep, and it's about the same on both sides. So this switch is indeed not able to charge. That might be a problem with the charge port, but it could also be bigger fish to fry deeper in the charging circuitry. So the next thing that I like to do is just put my eyes on the charge port and see what it looks like under the microscope. So let's jump under the scope and see what we have. There it is. And what we're really looking for is the, you know, what's the status of the little gold pins that are inside there what we want to see is nice straight even pins that can make contact with the charger oh and in this case you can see what the problem is right there look at the pin that is all the way over here and notice how it is it's bent may it's massively mangled it's bent all the way down see that way down there so we're supposed to see these nice straight looking pins and not one that's folded over on itself. This is actually pretty good because it means that yes, the charge port is definitely a problem. And it also means another thing that we like to see. It means that we don't have pins that are all mashed and mangled together, crossing and connecting to each other, which can often indicate that you're gonna have fried chips in addition to your bad charge port. If you see no damage at all, then that's also sort of not a good sign. This is ideal. We want to see physical damage to the charge port before we replace the charge port. Otherwise, you're just introducing variables. You don't really know what's going on. Now, <laughs> the next step, I'm going to have to disassemble this sucker, which is just a whole lot of screwdriver work that is probably pretty boring. So let me see if I can speed this up for you. Okay, battery is disconnected. I don't think you guys need to watch me. Let's keep going. We got to get the logic board out. All right, let's put a little heat on this. A little hair dryer heat on that sticker. A little alcohol. Huzzah! Board is officially out. Now let's take a look around. I'm making sure there's no, you know, frank water damage, corrosion, no flux, like maybe somebody's been fixing this before, and making sure everything looks pretty normal. And this one looks pretty, pretty standard. Here's what we're dealing with. This is our charge port that we need to replace. And it's held in by these one, two, three, four big ground heat sucking lead free solder. It's going to need to get up to over 217 degrees to melt. That's going to be our anchor points, or as we learned from, uh, we learned from the official guys, 
mechanical flanges. Uh, and then we've got our pins. And one thing that I've learned to avoid on these is make sure that you pay attention to your pins because the last thing that you want to happen on these is to get melted anchor points, lift that thing up and have your pins still be stuck down because then you'll rip up a bunch of pads. So you'll want to put your eyes on those. Let's flip over and on the other side, we can just see these other sides of those anchor points. So what I'm going to do in the Jessa method, I'm going to do a step that I call downgrade alloy. So in order to melt all of this ground, which is going to be sucking the heat into the board and away from my hot air, I'm going to use just regular old strong leaded, you know, leaded solder, the good stuff from the 70s. This is the stuff that, you know, went to the moon, right? The strong stuff, not the old high heat lead free factory solder that's on there for environmental manufacturing reasons. So let's go ahead and downgrade alloy, especially on the anchors, but also not forgetting about the pins. I'm going to use the biggest iron that I can. So one thing that I see a lot of beginners making a mistake about is using like, oh, a tiny little iron, like a little micro pen or something like that. You don't want to be using something tiny. Tiny stuff cannot transfer heat very well. So you really want the biggest tip that can fit in your spot. Another mistake that I see beginning micro solderers make is not like looking at the tip to make sure that the tip is actually able to transfer heat. These ones are kind of a poor example because this is a little bit oxidized. See how when I touch the tip, it doesn't quite take it as like, it, it kind of acts a little bit like oil on water or like it's made of wax. That is not what you want. So how can you recondition your tips? Uh, you have to get rid of the oxidation. You can try to mechanically get rid of the oxidation by wiping, 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 wiping. Uh, on something like copper braid, you can use one of those tip tinners or tip cleaners or something like that. But your goal is to have a big wide tip that can fit in the space and you're just trying to work this lower temperature, 183 Celsius is the melting point of this good old fashioned leaded solder 63, 37 lead to tin ratio and you're just working it into these joints to try to reduce how much heat this board needs to melt. What you're really doing is making a new alloy, downgrade alloy. All right, let's go on to the top of this guy. And the lower, the lower strength, I guess, that your hot air machine is, the more you need to reduce the requirement for heat. And this is one of my favorite ways. Now you might be thinking, well, if you can put uh, 183 on here, wouldn't it be even better to use one of those super low melt alloys like 138 or 148, the kind of solder that we use for re-soldering the two halves of the sandwich phone boards? And the answer is no, because this, this uh, port is going to receive a lot of mechanical stress over time. So you don't want to do anything that's going to make it ultimately weak. So if I were to use 138, you know, this stuff, 138, that would compromise long-term the strength of my new port. And I don't want to do that. All right, I'm going to not forget my pin. So it's actually going to leave me with a better, stronger port that is uh, more sturdy than what we had here originally by using the 183 solder. Now I did hear a point that one of our students made, one of our board repair students, uh, Gage from You Break I Fix, who said when he does ports, he actually likes for them to um, be put on there with a lower temperature solder so that when a customer inevitably breaks the port again that the port will just kind of rip rip up 
and not pull the pads with it. I thought that was kind of an interesting take. So, you know, like I said, everybody's a bit of an artist and there's no one right way to do these jobs. You can paint with your own brush and come up with your own way. So now that I've downgraded alloy, I'm gonna go ahead and try to take this port off. And I'm gonna crank my heat up way up, way up, because I'm really trying to flood this board with heat to try to get everything melted. And that's a real challenge on a board for a gaming system that is designed to suck the heat away into the board itself. All right, I'm gonna bring my heat with a nozzle that is about the same size as the port, and I'm gonna bring it from below. All right, maxing my heat out, maxing it up on this old station. I may even find that this station, my JBC, my 15 year old JBC may be underpowered and I may end up having to swap it out for a, uh, one of the Atoms that we sell in the iPad Rehab Supply Store. But we'll see if I can get it with my JBC, my trusty old JBC. All right, so we can see already that we have liquid anchors, liquid over there. So I'm gonna just use tweezers and let's see. Got her off. Woohoo! All right, here is the old mangled port. All right, now just for fun, I'm gonna go ahead and clear the, um, clear the holes that we see right here. I'm gonna clear these holes you don't have to do it this way. This is just the way that I think is fun to do it. And it's my favorite repair is clearing these holes with my solder sucker. So check this out. Clear it with this guy. Boom. Cool. So I, I'm not able to hold this straight up and down and show you guys under the microscope. So all I can do is heat it and prep this up. So fun. Look at that, when it's perfectly liquid, just push this away and pop. Got it. So fun, it's my favorite, favorite repair. Look at that, perfect. One more. Look at that, nice and clean. All right, this board is all prepped up and this style is what I call the flat swap. The advantage of clearing those holes is A, super fun, and B, I'll be able to take my new port and really position it in there and make sure that it is perfectly, perfectly in there the way that I want it to be. The alternative method is to do the hot swap method where you don't make any attempt to clear these anchor holes and instead you just heat it up and press the new port in there. I like to do this way a little bit better because it helps to prevent the plastic of the port that goes in these holes from you know getting overheated and becoming a gooey mess. But either way is perfectly fine. All right, before you put your new port in though, let's take a moment and inspect it. So this is one that was actually sent with this job. So I don't know if it's okay to install or not. Let's put our eyes on it. We're not just gonna trust new equals good because a lot of times these are not good even when they're brand new. So let's take a look at this port and let's see. So yeah, we can tell this port is used. Coming in a, in a new bag, I just opened the bag. Um, it looks like it's probably a mobile centrics part and you know, I'm gonna guess that it's just not possible to get bona fide new ones, but this is definitely pulled out of somebody else's Nintendo. It looks like trying to install somebody's used motor oil, um, but this is what they sent. So we're going to go ahead and install it. These ports are very simple though. Their only job is to basically be a socket. 
All right, so let's see, does it fit? Is it actually the, the right size? Yes, and that fits in there nice and flat. Now, the, here's the trick. This is what makes the Nintendo Switch USB-C charge ports a little bit of a challenge, is this row of pins here, the, the row that's close to the edge, how am I gonna know whether or not I have actually made bonds because I can't see them once this port is actually installed. So here's the way that I like to do this. What I like to do is I like to pre-tin that row of pins with my leaded solder. So I like to tin them up. All right, so I've freshened up those guys, and I'm gonna make a little bit of a puffy pillow on that inner row. Now here's the thing with ports like this. You have to be really careful to get them in there as flat, flat, and flush, flush as you can, because if there's any little bit of, you know, forward or backward, sideways, rocking, if you put that port in there just a little bit offset, then when you reassemble all of the plastics, the port will not sit flush with the plastic surround and you won't be able to plug your cable into it. So this is really worth a few extra seconds to be sure that you have this port in there, super flat, super flush. I'm holding it in here with my finger and what I'm gonna do first is get these anchor holes filled because I wanna do the pins last and here's why. If I do the pins first and then I end up coming along to the anchors and the tip and the port sort of moves forward or back, that could rip up pads on these pins and I don't wanna do that. So I'm gonna start with my anchors. I consider this like a bit of a rough draft because I am gonna come with some hot air and just sort of do like a final flattening and a final reflow, which is gonna make everything look really factory pretty at the end. So I'm just using a little bit of solder to tack these in. Keeping it flat, flat, flush, flush. Now my favorite tool for doing the pins is the mini hot tweezers because these are all very flat and the mini hot tweezers will just perfectly wick that solder right onto these pins. And I love this. This is also one of my favorite things. The mini hot tweezers are just so great at this one job. So I make them kind of a, what I call a dry paintbrush where there's uh, no solder in between them. And then I can apply solder right in that channel. And then I can come along here and just sort of like painting fingernails. Put a little flux first, a little more flux. And let's make sure you can see that we're just gonna paint the fingernails. This is so satisfying. And if you make like a bridge, don't worry about it. You're trying to get them all down, down on the pins and you can come and clear bridges later. Oh, so satisfying. All right, now the antidote to bridges is flux and a really dry iron. You can even use another pair of tweezers to try and like hold these pins like really down. I'm gonna take a look and make sure that I don't have any bridges that have kind of like crept up on those pins at all. And then flip it over. We'll add a little bit of solder to the bottom side, side and then we'll do kind of a final reflow to make sure that we've got that middle layer of pins actually soldered on.
Okay, so I saw it really kind of sink in and that tells me that that middle layer is now all soldered on. And I'm ready to let this cool down. I'm gonna clean it up and then I'm gonna test to see with my USB-C ammeter exactly what does the charging current look like now. One thing to be sure before I clean, I'm gonna make sure just doing a little touch test, I'm gonna make sure that I don't have any motion on any of these pins, just to be sure so that I definitely don't wanna to have to do like a second reassembly on this. I don't want this to just rip out and have this come back for any kind of warranty because the hardest part of this job for sure is taking this board out. Okay, so I've got the board just loosely assembled, clipped in the battery, nothing else is connected right now. And I just wanna see whether or not I have improvement of my charging current. All right, so I do. Last we saw this was about 0.1 and now it's up to 0.48, so it's about half an amp. So that to me looks like things are looking up. So I'm gonna go ahead and do the rest of my reassembly. <laughs> you just did that? Yeah. <laughs> Which flex? Oh, the big huge one right by the little bumper. Oh my God, that's the one I'm on right now. That's so, that it look, that's super easy to, to miss. How many screws did you have in before you realized it? Oh, I tested for touch after all. Oh my God. <laughs> You only realized it when you're testing for touch. So you're saying look under the microscope. I'm getting I'm getting hints from from Brad, the voice of the voice of Oz in the background. He says that he just put one together and forgot this cable. Let's do this one under the microscope. I love working under the microscope in general. So we can see how it works. So this little guy creates pressure. And we're going to slide this under. You have to be really careful if you're going to use tweezers like me. You have to be so careful not to bend these guys because they are, uh, they're very easy to crack. Oh, I see what you mean. Yeah, so it snugs right in there. That's definitely in there. But look at these thin little wires. It's so easy to crack one. Not on my watch. Not on my watch switch. That's kind of fun. Let's do all of these guys under the microscope so that just in case you don't have a microscope, you kind of at least have a, an idea of what, what it's gonna be like. Little antenna, what are these antenna guys for? Wi-Fi. Wi-Fi, okay. Well, what's, your, what's Brad's repairability score here on the, uh, on the switch light? Moderate. This is a major pain in the ass. What do you consider hard? <laughs> MacBook LCD panels. Okay. All right. I think that's all my my little guys. I'm gonna make sure though. Oh, this one almost got by me. Who's this little guy down here by the fan? This is the fan. Okay. Don't, don't forget your fan connector, folks. So if you're fixing this yourself, you got to do all this disassembly. If you are taking this in as a mail-in repair, I highly recommend board only. Last in, first out. Now, my little buddy, the speaker card reader tip if you make a video of your disassembly then you can watch it yourself when you realize oh uh, let me just check and make sure i know where these guys go that guy goes down there <laughs> not so fast nintendo switch light i got the playback tcrs circuit lumichill or whatever was that what this is yeah lumichill And this last flex. Bracket. Huh? Am I gonna test for touch before I put my bracket on? No need, unnecessary.
I'm going to do a full reassembly. Mm -hmm. And if it doesn't work, I'm going to take this out to the dumpster and get myself a sledgehammer. And either way, I'm smiling. All right, look at this. We have all those screws are put back in, no leftovers. And now let's see if we can get this sucker to charge. All right, and it says charging, and we see that it is indeed charging. So we are going to let it sit here, charging up until it turns on. And I think that one is going to be in the done pile. So there you go. That's the Jessa method for replacing a Nintendo Switch Lite charge port. And there's lots of different ways to do this. This is the way that I would do it if I were doing one of them and I really wanted it to work and I wanted to be sure. So kind of the DIY method. If I've got a whole string of these, then I'm going to start doing some high throughput stuff and I'm probably not going to clear the holes and I'm going to do more of a hot swap method. So there is no one right way to do this, but that's one way. That's the Jessa way. And I hope you guys share in the comments with how you do your Nintendo Switch parts and what little tips and tricks have you learned along the way? And what's your special, uh, special sauce? Please tell us below.